And joining us now on the line from New York, New York, Daniel Rosen, a fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Daniel, good to have you on the line from uh, the Big Apple tonight. How are you? Good, Steve. Thanks for having me on the show. Pleased to have you on. Let's really do an Economics 101 as we start with this tonight. The Chinese are being accused of manipulating their currency. What does that actually mean to be a currency manipulator? Well, it means different things to different people. For purposes of the uh, debate going on about uh, the Chinese currency, what it means is this, uh, that you are, uh, a government is intervening in markets to buy or sell its currencies or somebody else's in order to uh, arrive at a particular value for its currency. Not just to set that value, but to achieve some other objective. And the objective being suggested here is that China is trying to run a, tr a big trade surplus with the rest of the world and is setting the value of its currency lower in order to try to achieve that. So actually, a lot of countries uh, intervene in currency markets. They have what's called a currency board to maintain a, a pegged rate, what we call a pegged rate. Hong Kong does that, for example. Chile does it. We don't call them manipulators because day in, day out, year in, year out, they don't run giant external trade surpluses. And so uh, they're not intervening uh, to achieve that end. So, so we it's talk the about fact China that, manipulating. Yeah, the fact that the Chinese are running such huge trade imbalances with the rest of the world in, in their favor, of course, that's why the allegation of being trade uh, uh, currency manipulator is coming forward. Is that right? That's part of the story here. It's not just um, uh, manipulating the value. It's manipulating to va the value to some end, and the end is to run a trade surplus. Okay. That's the allegation. Do you believe it's true? Well, uh, it's true that China is intervening to uh, set the level of its currency, and it's also true that for the past five or six years, China has run a giant external trade surplus with the rest of the world. And note that I'm saying the rest of the world. The fact that the U.S. and China have a trade imbalance is less important to us in economics than the fact that China has a giant global trade surplus. So that's incontrovertible. And also the size of it, the magnitude is incontrovertible. It's way larger than anybody thinks is, is a reasonable uh, a size for a, a one nation's trade surplus to be. Uh, the currency clearly is playing a role in that. Estimates are all over the map. Some people think maybe just 5 or 10% undervalued against the dollar. Some people think as high as 40% uh, undervalued against the dollar. It certainly is somewhat undervalued. That's probably playing some role in leading to these big external surpluses for China, but it certainly doesn't explain the whole story. Okay, that's one side of the equation. Let's look to the other side of the equation, and to do that, we're going to ask the director, Michael Smith, to bring up our first graphic of the night, which is the tariff levels from 1992 to 2008, and we've got two lines on the screen, the top red line, the Chinese line, and then the American line on the bottom in blue. And the Chinese line st started a long distance away from the American one, but they're really very similar right now. They're very close together. China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001. They've greatly reduced their tariffs ever since. Should we, the rest of the world, be giving the Chinese more credit for the economic reforms they have made, in your view? It's a great chart, isn't it? And it, it's surprising to people who don't think about China all the time. It's even surprising to uh, policymakers who, who talk about China all the time. The fact is, China is not averse to importing. They're not protectionist in the traditional sense that other uh, East Asian emerging markets were. They're not keeping foreign goods out. They're importing huge amount of stuff every day. The issue is that they're exporting even more, uh, and so much so to lead to this giant trade imbalance. But it's possible to sell goods to China. Canada does it. The United States does it. Uh, all of the, the rest of Asia runs a giant trade surplus with China. So the problem isn't China's willingness to engage in two-way trade per se. The question is, uh, what's the nature of this giant imbalance that's built up? And is it going to correct itself without a change in the exchange rate, or does that need to be part of the equation for getting China onto a more sustainable track? Okay, let's just play this through then, Dan. How would, let's, let's say the Chinese did something differently. Maybe they intervened a little less than they're doing right now, uh, and they allowed the value of their currency to rise vis-a-vis -vis the American dollar. How might that help American manufacturers? Well, so there's really two things here, Steve. It gets tricky. It may or may not help American manufacturers. We have, we have to ask that question. Uh, it certainly would help reduce China's giant trade surplus with the entire planet. Uh, if China made its currency a little bit more expensive against the dollar, then the first manufacturers that would be helped by that are manufacturers in Bangladesh, 
and Vietnam and the other countries that have a similar labor cost structure to what China has. Uh, that's where uh, a lot of the imports to the United States would shift to. A little bit of it would come back to the U.S. It would make Chinese goods a little bit more expensive in China. It would make American exports to China a little bit cheaper uh, and not uh, just cheap compared to what China is producing, but more likely cheap compared to what uh, the Europeans are producing, the Japanese are producing. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of different uh, players in the game here. It's not just about China and the U.S. Okay, let's but talk it's about the American. Very important, it is very important to note, though, that a moderate amount of appreciation of China's currency is not going to take care of the needs of American manufacturers, per se. I understand. Okay, let's look at American consumers then. Do we assume that if the Chinese allow their currency to become a little more dear, that those many, many, many products that we all buy from China right now will be a little more expensive? Uh, maybe not, uh, in fact. Uh, let's say China raises the value of its currency against the dollar by, let's say, 5% or even 10%. Uh, those Chinese exporters, which, bear in mind, over 50% of China's exports are by multinational companies uh, like Nokia, and Motorola and General Motors and uh, companies from all over the world in China make up the lion's share of China's exports. A very big chunk of what they're exporting from China came into China as what we call an intermediate good first. So take an iPod or an iP the new iPad. Uh, maybe 90% of the value of that product came from Taiwan or South Korea. It was the computer chips that run that product are brought to China are assembled in China, and then it gets exported from China. So it shows up as a Chinese export, but a lot of what's inside it maybe came from outside. A stronger Chinese currency is going to mean cheaper intermediates that go into these projects, products in the first place. So it may or may not all pass through. In fact, if there's 10 percent appreciation of the Chinese currency, one wouldn't expect the, the uh, average export price for China to go up more than say two, three, four percent, something like that on average. Gotcha. So if we're going to see a significant change in prices for consumers or in the ability of manufacturers to be more competitive, we're needing, to, we're going to need a, uh, to see a change in, in currency value, you know, up near 30, 40 percent. Is that right? And at five to ten won't really get it done? If you were going to try to deal with this problem entirely with the currency variable, then indeed you'd have to go to something like 40 percent. And when you see economists, good economists, uh, put out a number like the Chinese uh, uh, renminbi being 40% uh, uh, undervalued, that's what they're doing. They're asking the question, if we were going to get China to back to a trade balance, how much would we have to appreciate the currency to do so? Uh, but really, it's unreasonable to think that this problem should be entirely put onto the uh, currency exchange rates. There are other considerations here, too, that affect the price of Chinese goods that contributes to the trade surplus they, they run. Uh, for example, the borrowing costs that big state Chinese companies enjoy. Uh, they pay very little uh, to rent the money they need to, uh, to finance their operations. Uh, intellectual property rights costs. When a Canadian company uh, uh, puts out a product, it pays a licensing fee to whoever holds the patent that they're using to build their product. There are intellectual property rights problems in China. Many, many Chinese companies aren't paying the license fees that they should be paying, and that's part of their products being unusually cheap. They're stealing, in other words. Uh, not to put too fine a point <laughs> on it, but that's a big part of the story. And if you talk to Microsoft or Siemens, a lot of companies that, uh, uh, that do nothing but innovate, they will say that as much as 70 or 80 or 90 percent of their product in China is effectively being stolen. Hmm. Okay, let's talk about the politics for a second here. The uh, American administration, the Obama administration, had asked for a report on whether China was manipulating its currency, and that report was about set to be made public around now, and now they've put a hold on making that report public. What, what do you read into the significance of that? You know, it used to be that the administration would have to ask for that report. Uh, the U.S. Congress got tired of, of uh, uh, hoping that the president would ask, and so it's actually legislated in the United States. The Treasury Department is required twice a year to issue an, a, a report on whether our ma major trading partners are manipulating their currencies. Uh, the, this one was due out April 15th. Uh, it has been delayed in the past. This is not the first time this report's been delayed. In light of uh, Hu Jintao's visit to Washington this week, and uh, additional major international meetings taking place over the next couple months, uh, Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner decided to, in advance, let people know that he was going to delay this one. 
uh, and, and wait a little bit longer before he put out his, his finding on this. I think it was actually a good move. Uh, as we have been discussing, I think a little bit too much weight and expectation has been placed on the idea that you can address the trade issues we have solely by focusing on the exchange rate. By pushing this one a little bit down the road, it gives the Chinese side a little more time to make an adjustment here so this doesn't have to take up all the oxygen in the room, which is really not a good use of uh, Barack Obama's time. Uh, or Hu Jintao's time. Although good local politics for a congressman, for example, to be beating this drum at this time? It's good politics if you can actually get some movement on it at the end of the day. And part of the problem with the international politics here is that the Chinese side is loath to set a precedent here that by beating the drums and uh, marching up and down Pennsylvania Avenue, the United States will get Beijing uh, to do what we want it to do, even when we are probably in the right on this issue. Uh, so as a matter of principle, they've been digging in their heels. The irony is that China really needs to appreciate its currency, not so much due to this foreign pressure, but for its own domestic macroeconomic reasons. And it's for those reasons, in fact, that they probably will go ahead and make a move anywhere from the next week to the next month or so, but not too much beyond that. But presumably they don't want to give the Americans the sense that they're doing it out of any indebtedness to them, I, I, not, uh, not financial, but uh, otherwise, if you know what I mean. Nor should the U.S. think that uh, 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 we owe China a favor if they do move on this. They need to do it for their own reasons. They're not going to do it as a favor to the United States or to the G20 or to anybody else. Uh, they're going to do it because it's the responsible thing to do as a major international economy now, and because if they don't, they're going to, uh, for a variety of reasons, create additional inflation in their own economy, which will be an even greater headache than having to listen to our, our Treasury Secretary's badger them about this. Well, now follow up on that a, a bit, if you would, Dan. You, you mentioned that they have their own domestic reasons why they ought to appreciate the value of their currency. You just mentioned inflation, uh, indebtedness politically to the United States, you say ought not to be on the scorecard. What should be on that scorecard for reasons why they might want to do it? Uh, investors around the world for the right reasons, expect that the value of the Chinese uh, currency is going to rise against the dollar. Meanwhile, the Chinese property sector has been growing by 30, 40, 50 percent a year in value in many of China's major cities. Interest rates are extraordinarily low in the West, especially in the United States. Put these things together and people are finding ways to move money, hundreds of millions, billions and billions of dollars into China every quarter. That's adding to the money supply in China. And that contributes to inflationary conditions in China. When you have more and more money piling up in an economy, the price level rises. You have the same amount of product available in stores, and you have billions and billions more dollars. What that naturally does is increase the bidding that people do for the products that are available, to, to try to simplify things a bit. And that's what contributes to inflation. So this, what we call carry trade, or hot money flow into China, as a result of this looming expectation that it's just a matter of time here before China has to make an adjustment is aggravating uh, 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 the inflation picture, adding to some overheating in China, and giving them a, a very big domestic macro reason to go ahead and start appreciating the currency. In which case, let me ask you just finally, since this is your business to uh, speculate on these things in the future, what do you think they're going to do and when do you think they're going to do it? <laughs> Uh, so that's the trillion-dollar question of the moment. <laughs> yes. Uh, everything taken together, uh, we would expect them to, at day one, make a move something like 3%, 4%, 5% against the U.S. dollar, probably, although they say that they're setting their currency rate against a basket of currencies and not just the dollar, but it has just been the dollar for some time. But that's not all. Uh, the day after that and from there forth, they're going to widen the trading band so that markets at the end of each day can continue to move the currency a little bit so that we don't have to always be waiting for the next big shoe to drop, but instead start to let the market decide whether the renminbi needs to be slowly moving in one direction or the other, and for the foreseeable future, it'll be the, uh, in the direction of appreciation, meaning uh, uh, worth more against the U.S. dollar uh, and other Western currencies. Understood. Dan Rosen, thanks so much for your help uh, on this uh, complicated, but uh, not so much anymore story. Thanks to you. Appreciate your time. Thanks very much.